Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. It is my privilege to introduce the crew of the final space shuttle mission, STS-135. To my left is Commander Chris Ferguson. Chris is a native of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and a retired captain in the U.S. Navy. He joined NASA in 1998 and has since served on two space shuttle missions. His first, he served as pilot on STS-115 in 2006, and next served as the commander of STS-126 in 2008. Since then, he has served as the deputy of the, sorry, deputy chief of the astronaut office before being assigned as commander for this mission last fall. He will lead this crew on their 12-day mission to the International Space Station. I'll now turn it over to Chris to introduce his crew. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, this is a day filled with, uh, filled with media. Uh, it's an interest, interest in the crew, interest in the mission itself, and uh, hopefully this morning you've had an opportunity to listen a little bit to uh, the mission itself. Of course, a lot of the focus has been uh, on the fact that this is uh, the historic final flight of the space shuttle, but uh, that said, we do have, uh, we have a very busy, very event-filled, packed mission that we have to pull off before we can uh, finish up on the runway and uh, celebrate the 30-year uh, history of the space shuttle program. Um, to my left uh, is the crew, and uh, I'm going to, uh, before I introduce Doug, uh, I'm going to gush on the crew a little bit. Uh, you know, this is the right crew uh, for the right time. Um, we have, uh, we've had only nine months to train, we've had only four crew members to do it with, and in that short period of time, we've managed to uh, have a lot of fun, we've managed to laugh, and we've managed to get an awful, awful lot of work done. So uh, what a great group of people, and it's been really my honor and pleasure to work with, uh, work with them, and it's going to be absolutely a joy to fly with them here in a short week or so. Uh, to my left is, uh, is the pilot, Doug Hurley. Uh, Doug is gonna keep me out of trouble, hopefully. He's gonna keep a good eye on me, make sure that I do what I'm supposed to do when I'm supposed to do it. Above all, put the landing gear down at the very end of the mission. He comes from upstate New York. He is a uh, active duty colonel in the Marine Corps uh, and a Hornet pilot. He's a veteran of a single space shuttle flight, STS-127, which, uh, which flew a couple years ago. Doug. Thanks, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'll get right to introducing our mission specialist one, Sandy Magnus. Uh, she's got a tremendous background, and she comes with a lot of space flight experience, uh, first on STS-112, uh, shuttle mission, and then she spent four and a half months uh, on board space station. So she is our space station expert on this mission. And also, uh, just as important, our uh, transfer czar, our load master. She's going to keep us honest throughout the mission, get everything transferred across the hatch. Uh, and, it, and it's just a great pleasure to be able to fly with her. Sandy? Thank you, Doug. Uh, to my left is Rex Walheim. He's a retired Air Force colonel. He's our mission specialist, too. So he's actually keeping an eye on Doug and Fergie during launch and landing and keeping them honest. So he'll prod Doug to prod Fergie to put the landing gear down. And uh, Rex has been on several, he's a veteran of two space flights, uh, lots of EVA time. He's actually our EVA expert, and he will be the one running the EVA that Mike and Ron will be doing for us. Uh, Rex is very detailed-oriented. He's backing me up on the Loadmaster, and uh, he's, he's been just fantastic to work with, and it's been a lot of fun. We're classmates, too, so it makes it even extra special. Thanks, All right, with that, we'll start with questions here from the Johnson Space Center. We'll start at this side, if you could... Uh, state your name and affiliation. Uh, hi, Will Hardwick. CBS News. Uh, I guess for, for the commander, uh, a lot of, we did learn about the mission today, and I think that if you were looking at this mission as a standalone flight, there have been other flights somewhat like this. What makes it unique, of course, is it's the last flight, and there's, there's so much history involved, there's so much emotion involved with everybody on the team. I mean, you've been asked this question about 9,000 times by now, maybe more. Um, but, but tell me a little bit about that. I mean, what's your all's view of the flight is from the historical perspective and how you're, how you're dealing with that? Yeah. You know, I, I, I was thinking about this a little bit uh, the other night. Why, uh, you know, why the emotion, why the passion? And, uh, you know, great mechanical achievements, you know, things that we have built over the course of our history, uh, ships, I mean, cars, I mean, we tend to personify them. We, we give them a life. And uh, the shuttle is uh, is is probably the epitome of something like that. You know, it's been uh, it's uh, it's been a, a lifelong uh, love for a lot of people who have worked on the program, 
and it's, it's probably gone a little bit longer than we thought it was. It has actually turned into careers. I mean, two generations of careers could potentially have, have occurred over the course of, uh, of the shuttle's uh, lifespan. And I, I think that that really, uh, therein lies the, the, the crux of why the emotion, because we, we do, we tend to treat these vehicles as though they're a little part of us. And, uh, you know, to see them go away, it's, it's a little bit like you're, you're, you're mourning a, a friend. And uh, uh, they've been wonderful to us. There's an enormous amount of history to look back uh, upon. And uh, when it's all said and done, I, I think we'll look back on the shuttle program and say it's just been a tremendous uh, success. Um, but, uh, you know, hope I answered your question in there somewhere, yeah. Okay, continuing on this side. Um, Irene Klotz with uh, Reuters. Um, I guess for any one of you who wants to take this, uh, where, where do you f um, feel the pinch most having just four of you? In other words, if you had like a fifth person or a sixth person, um, what, what would they be doing? Where do you, where do you feel the, where do you feel the absence the most? I think the, the busiest day we're going to have, we were actually discussing it earlier in the office, is flight day 12. Right after we undock and we're deploying the, the PicoSat, we got to have to get the cabin ready for return. We have to wind up some of the, uh, the last minute science that we're doing. We've got standard before landing checks, so it's an extremely busy day. And uh, there's no sort of white space, if you will. There's no cushion in the timeline. So we probably could use an extra pair of hands or two that day. The ground's going to help us out a lot, and um, we'll get through it. But we're going to be very, very busy at, at a very, very high pace at the end of the mission. All right, go ahead, Tracy. Tracy Watson, USA Today, I think for, for Rex. I know you've been really busy training, but has it started to percolate through that this is the last time you'll be doing, taking many of these steps with the last uh, ascent and entry, ascent sim tomorrow? Do you, did you stop and think about that or are you just too busy to give it no, any thought? No, we're not too busy to think about it because you know, originally thought you know, we're gonna concentrate our training and we, and we do concentrate on our training very much, but as these major milestones of last have built up, it's kind of become a crescendo. Uh, for instance, our first this would be the first one was our last single system trainer event, and which was you know a little a, a, one of the smaller events. Then we get into our our more bigger sims as our last uh, our last uh, uh, fixed base simulator or orbit sim basically. And then we started some of the really big ones, like the last rollout of a space shuttle vehicle down at uh, Kennedy Space Center. We went down there, and it's like wow, this is the last time one's going to roll out of the hangar. And then the rollout to pad obviously was a real big deal with uh, the last time, hopefully, a, uh, we hope we don't have to come back to the hangar for anything, but uh, all things considered, it should be the last time a vehicle rolls to the pad. And so as they get bigger and bigger, it gets a little bit tougher. It thinks, wow, this really is the last time we're going to do this kind of thing. So it, it, you can't ignore it. And uh, we still obviously, we also do our job, but as, uh, as, as Chris likes to say, we do try to savor each one of these little lasts and, and try to appreciate the people who made it possible. And also think about the people that, are, that have gone on to different jobs that are no longer here that uh, have been part of this program for 30 years. And it's, uh, it's really an amazing thing to, to be a part of it, kind of the tail end of it. All right, Ryan Korsgaard from KPRC here in Houston. Uh, and I guess this would probably be for our pilot. What is the one question you have not been asked about this last mission, <laughs> and what is the answer? Oh my God. You know, that's that. It's a great question, and I'm not sure I've thought of the question that I haven't been asked yet. <laughs> Honestly, Ryan. Um, you know, it, it is. You, you get the gamut from, you know, what's it feel like to, to be on the last shuttle flight to, you know, what are you going to do on flight day five kind of thing, you know, and that specific, that general. What are you going to be thinking about on, on the way back home? So, you know, honestly, I don't know what question I haven't been asked yet that uh, needs to be asked. But uh, we, we hope we, you know, get across the message that, you know, this, this is to honor all those folks that have worked on the shuttle for so many years. and. Uh, you know, we just we just want to do the best job possible to, to complete the program that way. All right, next, Gina. Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News for Sandy. So we heard a little bit earlier about the color coding process for transfers. Could you elaborate a little bit on how the back and forth will work and how you'll keep track of everything? Yeah, the transfer community has come up with a great scheme. Uh, you know, we're transferring, and since the dawn of time, you know, we've been transferring things back and forth across the station. So. Anything that we fly up with a yellow label on it needs to go to station. Anything with a green label that's on station, we need to grab and put somewhere either on the shuttle or the MPLM. So it makes it a little bit more straightforward to identify things that, that have to go across the hatch in one way or the other. And that, that's, a, that's a really nice scheme, actually, because it kind of lets you grab and go in some cases. But you must read the notes column of the transfer list to get everything right. 
Yeah, put think, that plug uh, in there. <laughs> if you stand still and hold a yellow label in your hand, you're liable to become a part of shuttle car, uh, station cargo. <laughs> so uh, it's we're going to reach a, a pretty uh, high pitch fervor uh, around about flight day five, moving uh, any one of the. Uh, Gosh, I think we have 360 CTBs. I mean, there's a there's an enormous amount of uh, just individual items that have to go over. So, it's... all right, next in front. Hi, Robert, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Uh, for anyone who wants to take it, um, there's been a lot of questions about the last that you're setting. But in the course of preparing for the mission um, or the mission itself, are there any firsts uh, that you'll accomplish or that you have accomplished during your training? Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of firsts. I mean, I think every shuttle mission has firsts. Uh, well, I'll, I'll give you one for instance that comes to mind. Um, you know, of course, uh, this is one of the last few opportunities we'll have to uh, get good photo documentation of uh, the outside of the space station. And Soyuz does provide us with some, uh, with some views, that, but the optical quality, I think, of the shuttle windows are just a little bit uh, better. So uh, what, uh, what we've coordinated after the undock is a, is a 90 degree station uh, yaw. So it's, it's going to rotate for us uh, so we can get some uh, real nice shots to perhaps quantify uh, uh, any um, atomic oxygen uh, damage or any damage that may have occurred to the side through MMOD uh, on both sides of the space station. Plus, I think it'll be an interesting perspective that we haven't seen before. So that's the first time I think we've done this. Anybody else have anything? Yeah, just one quick thing. I, I, it's, it's not a first that shuttle crew has gone to Russia to do training or other things, but I'm fairly certain it's a first for all four crew members to be fitted for Sokol suits and tested and all those different things. Uh, we, you know, we made two trips over to Russia for that very purpose. And as you know, that's, you know, in case there's some requirement for a rescue. So there are four Sokol suits sitting over in Russia. Actually, one is in the MPLM, Rex's, uh, you know, with his name on it, uh, ready to go in case they're needed. So that's probably a first. I, I, don't quote me on it, but I think it's probably pretty close. Actually, I have another example, if you don't mind. Um, we're using the Incos and the, 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 the community that owns the shuttle cameras and the shuttle flight control room. They're actually going to be actively assisting during the robotics work because we're shorthanded on board. Fergie is going to set some up and then be released to go do some transfer and some other tasks. So we're actively using the Incos in a way that we haven't used before, and they'll be controlling cameras and setting up cameras and helping us with our robotics tasks. So that's the first time that's happened. And that's kind of the uh, one of the scenarios of this mission that was, is always going to be the case is that the, the ground is our MS uh, three, four, and five. So uh, uh, we're going to we're going to use them like they're with us. And there's going to be times where we're not going to know the answer to a question, so we're going to call the ground as if we had our, our fellow crew members up there. And so uh, we're just one big team, and uh, we're going to definitely need their help with only four sets of hands on board. All right, next question in the center. Go ahead. Jill Tolk, Bay Area Houston Magazine. I have a traditional question that I've been asking both shuttle and station crews during their pre-flight press briefing, so I'll continue that tradition here for Fergie and whoever else wants to chime in. What do you think will be the most challenging part of your mission and also the most rewarding part? Um, I'll, I'll kind of start out where Sandy left off on the challenging. Uh, the challenging part of this mission, I, I believe, uh, be flight day 12 after undocking, the day before we get ready. Uh, you know, there'll, there'll be a, a public affairs uh, event that day that um, will probably be fairly popular, so we have that to fit in along with all of the other normal uh, events that normally take place uh, prior to part of landing. Uh, we have to turn the orbiter back into a, an airplane, if you will. We have to set the seats up. We have to run cooling lines. We have to pack everything away so it's not going to fall when we re-enter. Um, so, uh, so there's our big challenge day. And like I said, followed clo closely there uh, in trail by flight day two, which is the inspection day, which we normally pull off with about uh, six folks in, in rotating uh, fashion. But we've made a few accommodations to what normally occurs on flight day two uh, in order to fit everything. So uh, anyhow, that's... That's my cut. Anybody else got a? I think for me, the challenging day will be uh, during the spacewalk. Uh, I'm going to be controlling the spacewalk from inside. I'm not going outside to do the spacewalk, but I'm going to be helping uh, uh, Mike and Ron do the spacewalk by reading their checklists, reading their emergency procedures. And it's going to be a little bit lonely on the space shuttle's mid deck or flight deck that day because usually when I do as a, the IV, which is called the intravehicular crew officer who's, who's directing the, sp the, the spacewalk, I usually have somebody else working the tapes, making sure everything's set up, working the, hel the, the cameras for the spacewalker so they're not uh, blooming out and they're, they're in the right uh, focus and stuff, right? Uh, 
right, um, light scheme. And so there's going to be times where I'm going to be holding onto a checklist, holding onto the mic and saying, a little help here, and there's going to be nobody around. So uh, it's going to be a little challenging. And we've, we've actually also accommodated for that, that when I, if I need a break, for instance, I will call down to the ground and we'll have what's called a ground IV or intervehicular officer. That's Kate Rubens. So I'll give her a heads up. Hey, Kate, I'm going to need to go uh, take a break. So you're going to be taking over in about five minutes, and she'll take over from the ground controlling the spacewalk. I'll come back, get my bearings, what's going on, and I'll take the spacewalk over again. So it's going to be a challenge for me to be uh, in a number of different places at one time during that spacewalk. Okay. I'm Mary Ann Dyson with National Space Society and Not Oster Magazine. Um, I think I have a question for Doug that he hasn't been asked before, but you'll have to tell me or not. Uh, I'd like you to describe the payload bay door opening maneuver that, uh, during post-insertion and what it looks like out the windows and so on as you move. How long does it take to, to get to that attitude? And then which one of you is opening the, the doors? And will this be the last time that the payload bay doors are actually opened? And we'll see that. And have you on any of your other flights noticed uh, anything coming out of the payload bay like they did on the the first shuttle flight, when we first opened those doors, uh, there was some stuff that floated out. And I just wondered if you've ever noticed anything float out of the payload bay. Uh, on my first flight, uh, I actually barely knew that we opened the doors because I was busy doing something else. I remember looking back, and you just get the light starts to come in from the back windows as the doors open. It doesn't take very long. Rex and Fergie are going to are going to do it on our mission. At least that's the the tentative plan. Um, and you do, you see some bits and pieces of small bits and pieces of stuff floating out occasionally. I know that's fairly common, you know, dust particles and other things like that. But, uh, you know, usually you have uh, a camera running and you have at least uh, two folks looking out the back window to see anything if it looks big and they can grab a camera if they need to. But, uh, you know, it's a pretty standard maneuver, and yeah, as far as I know, this will be this will be it for payload bay door opening. Uh, we hope to just open them once and close them once on the way home. Right, Denise okay. Chow at Space.com. Um, question for Commander Ferguson: um, A lot of has been discussed today about this being a, a four-person crew, and um, I was just wondering how valuable is it that everyone on your crew has a significant amount of spaceflight experience, and has that made your job easier so far? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd have to say it's invaluable. Uh, it would have been, uh, at, at, everyone has flown once, and we all are rookies at one time. And I think we know that as rookies, we carry just a little bit of a, I don't want to say liability, but it just takes a little while to get up to speed. Uh, I think having uh, four folks who have done this at least once uh, in the past uh, will add dramatically to, uh, to our efficiency on orbit. And that's really what it comes down to. How quickly can you do what you need to do uh, when it's on your timeline? Um, you know, if I, I just want to get back again to this flight day 12 thing. Uh, we were talking to our entry flight director, Tony Sakachi, yesterday a little bit, and, and even he, I think, was taken back a little bit by, uh, he said, I looked at your flight plan on, he says, on flight day 12, and there's absolutely no white space on your schedule whatsoever. Of course, white space just being those little moments you have to catch your breath between the activities that you have to do. So uh, again, you know, just to touch on what what you were alluding to, uh, having uh, four folks with the experience and the background to do these things, uh, we're hoping that we can create our own white space by doing them quickly enough that, uh, that we catch a break or two during the day. Pat Patton, Gidry News Service. This is a question for all of you. What is your message to America on the last flight, especially the, the school children? And what special memento are each of you flying into space? Uh, well, I'll start. Um, boy, I'll tell you, if I had to look back and, and come up with a single message that could somehow summarize the tremendous success of the, of the shuttle program, I'd say that it, it lies, especially when we talk about school-aged children, is the inspiration that it, that it provides. Um, you know, I, I was inspired as a, as a high school student and a college student, um, and I was in college when I watched STS-1 launch from a television in the college cafeteria, and I remember thinking to myself, it would just be fantastic to be a part of a program like that. Um, I, I think as now we're going to transition slowly to uh, commercial uh, crew capability, you know, to get us to low Earth orbit and to the International Space Station, but it seems like in that period of time, uh, in, in the 60s and 70s and, and early 80s, we were extraordinarily focused on the government organization that got us all there. And uh, I, I can speak at least personally, it, it really, it set a tone for me. So I, I think we're going to miss a little bit of that, you know, that motivation uh, fact. Uh, as far as a personal memento I'm taking, um, 
you know, we've uh, we've had a, a lot of uh, we've had a lot of requests. Everybody just with that one last thing that they would like to fly on a space shuttle. Um, I am uh, I'm taking uh, a medallion uh, that will celebrate the centennial of naval aviation as my as my personal item. Uh, there are a few others in there. Uh, it's of course a milestone for the Navy, Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard as they celebrate 100 years of flying. And with Doug and I, uh, both with. Uh, uh, naval aviation training backgrounds, uh, we thought it was appropriate. Yeah, I, I would have to echo some of Fergie's remarks. I, I mean, you know, the, this is what I remember inspiring me to get into this business was, you know, watching STS-1 launch and, and seeing this magnificent white vehicle go into space uh, for the first time. And, and it's really just, it's been there my whole adult life. And, and uh, just, just the, the majesty of it, as Rex says, and just, just the accomplishments that, that, that we've had. And I hope soon there will be another space program, a vehicle that we have that will inspire children the same way to, to want to get into this business or get into math and science and engineering and those types of fields. Uh, because it, you know, that's kind of what led me down this, this path and, it, and it's just been a great ride. Um, as far as uh, what I'm taking, uh, I have a, uh, Marine Corps flag and a, a small Marine Corps flag and a small Navy flag. You know, as, as Fergie said, you know, we're naval aviation background and it's the 100th uh, centennial uh, for naval aviation and we're, we're very proud to be naval aviators and, uh, you know, we just want to take a little bit of that with us uh, into space. You know, as human beings, we naturally like to explore every time you read a new book or take a different route with your car, or try a new food. And, and I think what the space program does is sort of illustrate to young, young people and actually our country, you know, this need, this drive, this desire to explore on a large scale. So I, I would say to young people, it's like, look at all of the, the frontiers that we have yet to explore. And, and using math and engineering and science and technology to do that is, is just fascinating because you're figuring out how the way the world works and you're learning how to take all that and build these vehicles and these procedures and these processes that let us move those boundaries even more and, and more further away. And it's just really exciting to be able to do that. And no matter what the, the job you have at NASA, you are part of that process. And it's just very exciting to be here and, and it's a really neat industry to get into and, and to work in. As far as mementos go, um, taking some, some items from the universities that I attended and some small trinkets from my family. And for me, I think they've, uh, my crewmates have pretty much echoed my uh, feelings about what a message should be to America. I think, number one, it should be celebrate what the space shuttle's done. 30-year incredible career where it's launched probes to different planets. It's launched the Hubble Space Telescope. It's fixed the Hubble Space Telescope. And then the crown jewel, it's built the International Space Station. So from that, I hope we celebrate what the shuttle did. And then I hope we, uh, as we use the International Space Station in the age of utilization, and we learn about our, the human body, about how to survive in space, about how to build systems that can survive in space, I hope that inspires us to take the next step. Because the next step is to go beyond low Earth orbit, and we really need to take that step. And I hope the celebration of what the uh, space shuttle has done does not, does not die off and that people have a chance to say, you know, we've done some great things. Let's do the next thing. Let's help the, uh, the commercial industry get us to low Earth orbit, but we've been doing that for 50 years, so now let's take the next step. Let's go beyond Earth orbit. And so I hope it, uh, it does inspire people for that. For stuff I'm bringing, I'm bringing some uh, medallions and uh, some uh, charms for my family and friends and uh, that uh, kind of some of the standard stuff like that. All right, in the center here with Ted. Sandy, Ted Oberg from Channel 13 here in town. I, I'm thinking about 8,000 pounds worth of stuff you're taking up, right? And you have the benefit of weightlessness. But is it still, how, how tiring, how much physical work is involved in moving you know, 8,000 pounds worth of stuff from the minivan into the living room? You know, it, it's funny because what we'd like to do on flight day six and seven is set up one of those bucket brigades where you kind of toss the bag to the next person and then toss the bag to the next person and that, that'll turn it into kind of a game. But, it, you know, it's, it's fun to fly around um, with these bags back and forth and it's, it's demanding from the viewpoint that you're always in motion and it's actually mentally demanding because you have to keep track of what you transferred and, and things like that. Um, but it is interesting because you're in zero gravity, you have to pay attention to the mass of the item that you're moving because it, you know, the easiest way to move things is usually to hold it between your legs or give it a push. And if the mass, for example, we're transferring a, a treadmill 
uh, track, and it's about the same mass as I have. And I moved one of these on 112, and so as I reached up to, you know, I was holding it between my knees, and I reached up to move, and I started rotating instead of translating because my center of mass had changed because I had so much more uh, down near my knees. And, started, and so you have to think a little bit about what you're moving and how it relates to you in order to adjust how you're trans translating around. And that's kind of interesting. You know, you get a little lesson in Newton's laws while you're doing your work. But, but uh, it's a lot easier to move it around up there than it is down here. All right, next, um, Eric. Eric Berger with the Houston Chronicle. And I'm wondering what it's like. Uh, it's, it's kind of like, in some respects, that you're Super Bowl athletes uh, with all the requests I imagine you've gotten for launch tickets. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, just sort of the hoopla around the launch and sort of the interactions you've had with family and friends about it uh, since everyone is really focused on this one. Mm -hmm. good. Rex, you're always good at these kind of oh questions. Oh, boy. Well, <laughs> it, it has really been, it has been tough uh, trying to figure out uh, how to make sure everybody's taken care of, that people get a chance to see the launch. And uh, that is a, it is something that goes on beside, you know, behind the scenes as we're training for the flight. Um, but what I've tried to do is I first of all try to make sure my immediate family is taken care of. Everybody's got, got tickets and uh, then you branch out to some of your friends and you also branch out to the people who've done stuff for you in the past. Some of my old bosses, I want to make sure I take care of them. Some of my, and then I want to make sure I take care of my coworkers, the people I've worked with here at the Johnson Space Center and other places. So I make sure they're invited and, uh, and then you, you get a number of requests as you mentioned. The, the, the tickets are starting to get more valuable to people as we get closer. And, uh, and then you have to make the real hard choices because you end up with just a few choices left and you, get, you find out there are people that are sick kids that want to come to the launch and we were able to work with the public affairs people to bring people, you know, sort of the make-a-wish type of uh, uh, request to get to the launch and to be able to, to, be able to see it close. So we've had uh, people from Iraq, wounded veterans that, that want to come to, the, come, to the, uh, come to the launch and we made sure that uh, he, got, uh, he got tickets and he's being well taken care of too. So. There's stuff like that that um, you just have to make some hard choices, and but it, it works out. It's worked out very well. The NASA's taken real good care of us, given us a lot of tickets to to hand out, and we've been able to take care of uh, most of the people that uh, that we that are the closest to us, and we also the people that maybe aren't as close to us that we think are the most deserving. So, it hasn't been easy, but I think we've uh, we've done our best to try to be as fair and uh, equitable as possible. You know, if I could just tag on to that, I mean, we are as enormously proud of this vehicle as I think the rest of America is. And I've always espoused, you know, every taxpaying American citizen needs to go see a, a space shuttle launch because they come back uh, after seeing it and they're a little bit different. You know, they understand, they get it. Uh, so uh, we have tried to, and I found, you know, through my opportunities to launch, I've tried to space those out. I've tried to uh, allow people different turns to come because I do want, you know, to do my little part to try to enable as many people as possible to come and see because they will remember this event for the rest of their lives. Okay, up in the front, Marcia. Um, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press. Astronauts never want launch delays, but with only eight days left to the last shuttle flight, could you use some more time just to let the program go on a little more before it has to come to an inevitable end. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll give you uh, my two cents. I'm sure everybody has a feeling on that. Uh, you know, the crew is, uh, we've been enormously busy, especially here in the last month or so. Uh, uh, personally, I'm looking forward to quarantine tomorrow to settle down a little bit, uh, maybe ga gather some of my thoughts, take a few notes, and uh, review some of the things that I've desperately needed to review for the last um, couple weeks or so. Um, th that have kind of got lost in, in this, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the excitement surrounding uh, the final mission. So I, I just kind of leave it at that. I'm looking forward to a little bit of quiet time. Um, you know, just leading up to the, the, to the final launch, you know, eight days away, it does sound so final. Um, I, I don't think we want any more time, though. We're ready, we're trained, and uh, we want to go do it, and we want to go do it on time. So anybody have anything else to add to that? Yeah, just kind of to tag on what Rex was talking about with guests, you know, I, I was part of a mission that did not go on time, uh, not even close. We scrubbed, I think, five times before we finally went. And uh, the, we have the easy part of the job getting on the rocket and going into space in that regard. You know, they're sitting there waiting, anticipating, going through all the things that they go through prior to the launch and then to have delays. It, it, it's real tough on your family, your friends, and your guests. So. Just from that standpoint alone, I'm a little sensitive to hopefully we will go on time the first day. So. Okay, back in the 
Uh, Greg? Uh, Greg Dobbs with HDNet Television. Since there is no rescue vehicle in the event you need one, uh, can you describe your long stays and your periodic departures from the space station? Yeah, uh, as you know, because we don't have a rescue vehicle, we'll be coming home uh, sort of in a line on the Soyuz with Rex coming first and then Fergie and then Doug and then I. And so we will slowly become incorporated into the space station uh, lifestyle. Uh, when, if, when this would happen, if this would happen, Rex's ILK would go immediately into the Soyuz uh, that Ron Garens, I believe, is the right one in. And then Fergie's would go where Mike Fossum would go. So Mike and Ron would actually extend their stay in order to accommodate uh, Rex and Fergie coming home. And then the next couple of Soyuz would come up with an empty right seat, and then Doug and I would slowly rotate down as those Soyuzes came down after their full six-month mission. As far as uh, being ready for it, we had some training, uh, basic training on the space station, some of the big picture emergency type scenarios and some of the warning type scenarios where we would have to react quickly and, and expeditiously. But the plan is that if we would have an extended stay on the space station, we would get additional training on the station. And it's actually, you know, after living there for a few, few weeks, you can very easily get into the routine of the everyday life and how you do operations, and then the specialized training would come over a period of a month or uh, two, or however the training community felt was the appropriate rate to, to set to us. So it, it's, there's a very good plan in place, and we'll be able to, I think, uh, sort of assimilate into space station life fairly straightforwardly if it would happen. And if I can just add on to that as well, it's, uh, you know, this is a very low likelihood case, but the NESC, the, the engineering safety arm of, of NASA, has done an extraordinarily thorough job of making sure that we have a good plan to get home. Um, and the order in which the people were picked were key. Uh, of course, Doug and Sandy, you heard, uh, you heard them say they'll be last. It's so because they have talents that we need on board as long as possible. So I wasn't sure whether to take that personally or not. But uh, <laughs> Sandy and Doug will be there for, uh, for a good long time, uh, lending their robotic and, and EVA, uh, potentially EVA skills to, to the mix to make sure that we're able to uh, serve a station, even if we're down to largely just the shuttle crew being there doing it. OK, the second row, young lady. Haley Kappas at the Galveston County Daily News. This is a question for Sandy. Uh, we've heard a couple of people talk today about how they aren't looking at this only as the final shuttle mission. They're looking forward to what's next for NASA. And I'm just curious if you're taking a similar mind frame. I'm sorry, I missed the last part. You're curious. Can you repeat the last yeah, part? Can you please? Uh, th some of the people today who we've heard talk are talking about how uh, they're not looking at this only as the last space shuttle mission, but they're looking forward to what's next for NASA. And I'm curious if you're taking a similar mind frame. Oh, certainly. I, th I think we're all excited about the opportunities um, that NASA will have in the future to get out of low Earth orbit and start pushing the boundaries of our, you know, our, our space exploration. If you look at what we've been able to do for the last uh, many decades, we've established ourselves very firmly in low Earth orbit to the point that there are commercial companies who feel comfortable in starting to operate in that same arena. And that's what, as a government agency, we are supposed to do, is keep breaking down these frontiers. And so now that you know, there's, there's interest developing in low Earth orbit, and these, these particular frontiers have been uh, explored and sort of you know, understood at some level, it's, it's important for us to go beyond low Earth orbit. And we're looking forward to those kinds of missions, you know, whether it's to the moon or Mars or high Earth orbit, you know, satellite servicing or an asteroid or, or whatever uh, it may take. We, you know, we're learning lots by living on the International Space Station for long periods of time to establish the information that we need to start taking longer and longer missions to various destinations. And it's, it's going to be pretty exciting, I think, when you start seeing that. OK, there in the front in the blue. Phil Sloss with nasaspaceflight.com. Um, are there, for any, for any of you, are there any advantages to only having four people on the space shuttle for a mission? I'll, uh, I'll give you the short answer. There are less opinions to contend with. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure everybody probably has a feeling about this. You know, there's pluses and minuses. Uh, the minus is, of course, is there's just less hands to hold things and help you do work. On the plus side, um, there's uh, two or three, depending upon what you consider a full crew, less, fewer seats, fewer chutes, fewer uh, uh, parachutes to do with, you know, fewer space suits. So there's, there's less bulk associated with it. But, you know, I think by and large, having another body on board is a, is, is a positive thing. And uh, the, the net effect will be, will, we're 
we'll miss them. Yeah, I think we thought, uh, you know, when we had four people on the crew, we thought, wow, the mid deck is just going to be this expanse, you know, relatively in space terms. Uh, and we found out fairly quickly that that was not the case. Uh, the programs did their best to make sure that every nook and cranny of the shuttle was filled to take stuff up to station for this, you know, next phase. So uh, not quite as much room as we thought. So I think, like Chris said, we maybe could have used an extra hand. Might have been a little better for us in the long run. Okay, next here in the green. Gerhard Daum with the German Space Agency and Space Expo Association. Question for Rex. Could you explain a little bit your role as an IVA for the spacewalk? Sure. The, uh, when we get to the space station, we are basically one big team, the, the shuttle and space station combined. And since we're kind of shorthanded on the shuttle, uh, it would be harder for us uh, potentially to do the spacewalk by ourselves like some, uh, some missions have. And so the decision was made early on that it, just to use the whole team and to use uh, Mike and Ron as the spacewalkers. And so that's great. They've done spacewalks before, so it made a lot of sense. Now, I'm the lead spacewalker for contingencies, if we had it. Um, uh, so that made me the choice for the IV, which is intravehicular, the guy inside who, uh, who monitors the spacewalk and helps them read their checklist. So my, my job will be to basically be their, their eyes and ears for things that they can't reach in space. When they're out there and, and uh, doing a spacewalk, they, they want their checklist, but they don't have them with them. The only thing they have is a cuff checklist on their arm that they can read for emergencies, quick actions. I'll have all the detailed steps for what they need to do. I'll have what's called a crib sheet, which is uh, the, the, what you do when something doesn't go right. And I'll, have, uh, I'll have also have a copy of their cuff checklist. So I'll guide them through and help them go step by step through these, uh, uh, through these procedures. And the nice thing about it is that since they launched earlier, uh, Sandy and I have had a chance to, to go in the water and, and basically proof a lot of these procedures. So we've gone through them several times and making sure to get them as, as finely tuned and as, as easily executable as possible. And I think we're there. And uh, Mike and Ron have obviously seen it, but they haven't seen it quite as, some of these tasks quite as much. And so my job will be to kind of guide them through that when they execute it. Okay, next question here in the Andrew black. Key with Harbor Journalism. The space shuttle was an American program, but it built the International Space Station. Can you speak briefly about how far we've come in working with our space partners? And Sandy, could you take a moment to speak to young women and girls about what it means to be part of the last shuttle flight? Well, I, and in terms of what the shuttle program has done with respect to you know international space work, I think you can say that it paved the way for the space station in a lot of ways because the shuttle provided a lot of opportunities for people to fly and we had a lot of international partnerships on the space shuttle building up to the space station program. And of course, it was an integral vehicle for the building of the, the space station. And, um, and that program, of course, will continue on and, and we'll get some great science and work from the space station in the future. As far as being the last woman on the space shuttle, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a funny milestone because Fergie's the last Navy guy and, and uh, Doug's the last Marine guy. And, He's the last, Rex over here is the last Air Force guy, and we're continuing to fly people in space, women, men, engineers, scientists, pilots, flight engineers, people from all walks of life, and, and that will just continue to expand that pool as we you know, expand our roles in space. So I, I would, though, encourage the, any young woman listening that uh, they should consider math and science and engineering and technology as a career because it's a lot of fun. You get to, like I said earlier, you get to figure out how things work. You get to take that and make new things. And it's like putting a big jigsaw puzzle together. It's just a lot of fun. And so I would, I would really encourage young people to follow those kinds of career paths. Okay, here in the black. Yeah. Uh, Jim Ogre with NBC News. Uh, it's fascinating to see how you worked on having a four-person crew do the job of a five or six or seven-person crew. But Chris, you had a leg up on that, didn't you? Weren't you the commander of the four-person crew that was standing by to rescue the Hubble mission? And did that have any, what kind of thinking did you do about that? You were almost ready to launch. So you were ready to launch with the four-person crew two years ago. Did that have anything to do with your, your selection perhaps for this mission? Uh, that's actually a very good point because we started for a template for the busy times of flight. We, it's a post-insertion shortly after launch. It's a very busy time as you convert the orbiter from a rocket into you know, a place to live for the next couple of weeks. And also, prior to landing, there's another big conversion that goes in there. It's a very busy day. And I started with the templates that I had from STS-400, which, of course, as you said, was a four-person crew to do something like that. So I had a little bit of an advantage. Uh, but 
if you had to look at these rescue flights that we have continually maintained the capability to do, we have always had a, a four-person crew, and the, the commander who had just launched, who ends up by default being the commander for the rescue flight if it's needed, always has a plan. So we had a little bit of a leg up, but it, it, was, a, it was still a lengthy process to put the, together an entire uh, mission for four people. Okay, at the end. Helen Boyle with MSNBC. Um, I heard that this is the first crew where everyone on the crew is uh, twittering away. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the experience of tweeting? Is there kind of an alpha tweeter among you, someone who you look up to for advice? That would have to be Sandy, I think. Yeah, yeah I think I, I get that prize, mainly because I had started on um, Twitter a couple years ago when I did a USO trip to Iraq after my Expedition 18. Uh, trip and so I, I had a little bit of introduction to it, but I will say that I, I keep the, the tweets that I do are very simplistic and just words. These guys send pictures and do all kinds of sophisticated things. So I may have the quantity, but I don't necessarily have the quality. <laughs> I think I've used it as an avenue to social networking. It forces me to learn a little bit about what everyone else is doing out there. So I, I've, en I've enjoyed it. But it reached a culmination yesterday when we were learning about our survival radios, which is a very capable survival radio if we ever needed it. And uh, I asked the question, well, but can it send a tweet? And uh, I, I think the answer was no. <laughs> okay, I think we have one last follow-up here. Follow-up here. On, uh, it's uh, watching how busy things are on departure day. Uh, Chris, you all remember last time you were in orbit, I understand you left Sandy behind. Are you going to be extra careful this time? <laughs> well, if she's standing around with a transfer tag on her, she might end up in the wrong place. No, uh, we, uh, we're actually, we cannot leave anybody behind. We cannot afford to leave anybody behind on this flight. And I know that uh, Sandy would love to spend another uh, increment up there. Uh, of course, we're taking her back to her home, her former home. Uh, but uh, we, need her, we need her for the ride home. Okay, with that, we will be switching over to Kennedy Space Center, where we have a reporter with a couple of questions. Hi, thanks very much. James Dean with Florida Today. Um, we, we had a pretty neat opportunity down here recently to, to climb inside uh, Discovery's crew cabin and it really helped to, to get a better appreciation of the kind of environment you guys uh, work and, and live in up there. And I just wondered if any of you could, you know, Doug, you mentioned um, that, that uh, the mid-deck still won't feel quite as, uh, won't feel real expansive. It, it certainly didn't feel that way to me as being only one person in there. Um, Obviously, you'll have a little more room than, than usual this time, but, but can you or any of you just try to give a little bit of an impression of uh, just the experience, what it feels like to live and work inside a space shuttle? Obviously, there'll be times when you know, you'll be off, you know, you'll be able to get out into the space station, but for the times when perhaps you're not docked, uh, just you know, kind of the, what, it, what it's like to be in that environment. Are there any particular aspects that, that uh, are, are kind of your favorite parts of, of that life? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I think when we uh, we give tours, especially over in Building Nine, which has the full scale mock up of the flight deck and the mid deck, it gives people that sense of the actual size that we're dealing with. And one thing we always try to to convey to folks is remember, in space, you can use all the volume. Not it's not a floor, it's not a ceiling, it's not a wall. So uh, it does become a lot more roomy than you would think with the uh, obviously with the aid of microgravity because you can just put yourself up in a corner, get out of somebody's way if they're moving up upstairs or downstairs. Uh, but yeah, as I, as I kind of alluded to before, we have, uh, in place of seats on the mid-deck, we have uh, large transfer bags that are gonna be there, which you know, we, we initially didn't think they would take up that much space, but they're fairly big and they have a lot of stuff in them. So we'll work around those, but we can also use them as work tables uh, if, if needed and, and things like that. But it, it is, it's just the, to be able to explore an entire, the entire volume of the space shuttle makes it seem a lot bigger in microgravity than it is when it's on the ground. Well, thanks, and um, would any of you care to speak to at, uh, specifically Atlantis's legacy after uh, a 33rd flight. Um, obviously, we're, we're thinking more about the program as a whole, but uh, this being uh, its turn to take that last flight. Since I'm the Atlantis frequent flyer, I'll be glad to take that one. Um, Atlantis has 120 million miles on her, and I think she can handle 5 million more without a problem at all. 
She's taken me safely to orbit twice and home, and uh, I think it's an absolutely great ship. Atlantis has, has launched uh, like international, I'm um, sorry, probes to, uh, to Magellan to Venus and uh, Galileo to Jupiter. It's serviced the Hubble Space Telescope on this last mission, and it's brought up some of the big pieces of the space station, like the S0 truss and the Columbus uh, European Laboratory module. It's been an absolutely fabulous ship. Both times I've flown it, not a single alarm all the way to orbit. And I'm really looking forward to flying her again. Okay, we're turning back here to the Johnson Space Center. We have a follow-up on the right. Hello for Aviation Week. Uh, given that you're launching as a 12-day mission and you might need some more time, uh, how much will the four of you be thinking about con conserving power and that kind of thing, uh, maybe even more than they're thinking about it in mission control to give yourself the possibility of extra day? Yeah, I, I can take that one because we've been following this closely. Uh, we're right, if we launch on time, uh, of course, cryo O2 and H2 is usually the limiting factor. We use those to produce electricity in our fuel cells. Um, if we launch right on time and the, the load for the cryo tanks is favorable, we're, we're uh, under the impression we can get an extra day. At least we have another day capability. Whether we'll decide to add it on to the mission or not, I'm not sure. Uh, if we delay a day, uh, enough of that cryo will have boiled off. I don't think we'll have a full day capability. Uh, to, to answer your question about conserving power, no one has approached the crew, you know, flight directors, program management has not approached us asking us to voluntarily uh, conserve power. We, we always try to save it. Uh, and of course, there are formalities. Uh, we can go to a, um, a Group B power down, Group C power down if necessary. Uh, but the, the crew always takes a measure to save power. Uh, we always want to try to build a little extra margin into our capability, but no one has uh, formally asked us to voluntarily do that. Okay, I believe we have another follow-up here. Go ahead, Irene. Irene Potts with uh, Reuters uh, for Chris. Um, you mentioned uh, a little earlier that uh, when you're talking about your launch guests that people come back from seeing a launch a little bit differently and get a little better sense of what this program's all about. Um, well, obviously, that, that's going away. And I'm um, just wondering if uh, you have any thoughts about how NASA, I guess it's almost like a branding issue or something, like what, what sort of... Um, uh, experience people who are not flying um, can have that still make this program kind of viable and visceral and meaningful? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question, Irene. And I, I think that's why we're headed in the direction that we're headed, is to make it available, if not um, possible, but at least available to anyone who perhaps is not a NASA-trained astronaut. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm going down the wrong line, uh, tell me. But, uh, uh, you know, going over, and you talk about the NASA branding as well. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go out on a limb here and I'll say that the next, aside from these four individuals at this table, the next person that flies a, a U.S. rocket uh, to low Earth orbit um, probably will not have a NASA badge on. We'll probably have a, a badge that has Boeing or SpaceX or Sierra Nevada, or, which is kind of an interesting concept if you think about it, that we're headed in this direction. Now, as time goes on and those low Earth orbit uh, capabilities are proven, then we'll probably enlist the NASA astronauts to, uh, to go up and, and uh, you know, either pilot the rockets or at least transport folks to low Earth orbit. Uh, but uh, there is, there's definitely a metamorphosis going on, and we're going to see it over the, the course of the next four years as a lot of these commercial partners come on board and, and uh, you know, fly their, their rockets in 2015 or 2016. Okay, and I believe we have time for one last question. Marsha? Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. I notice you're all wearing dark, somber-looking suits. Um, are you mourning the loss of a friend, as you put it, Commander? Um, or is this just your way of commemorating what is a very big wearing, deal? I think we're wearing these colors because these are the color suits we interviewed with 15 years ago. <laughs> so that's the main reason we don't have a lot of suits. <laughs> but uh, you know, we do have these suits. We're not mourning. We're celebrating the 30-year program of the space shuttle. It's had absolutely tremendous accomplishments. The, the space shuttle has inspired us as it's inspired the, the, the workforce and the country as a whole. And you know, in some ways, I think the, the shuttle will continue to inspire people. Because now, for the first time, when these vehicles go to, go to museums, people are going to have a chance to go right up to a space shuttle and see a real one and think, wow, we used to be able to launch those things into orbit. And so I hope it, it generates that same kind of enthusiasm, that childlike enthusiasm when people say, wow, it, it can make it to orbit, let's do it again. Let's, let's make sure we do it again. And I hope it makes people redouble their efforts to, to get us to the point where we can not only go to low Earth orbit, but go beyond low Earth orbit. 
Okay, one final follow-up here in the center. Oh, it's gonna be the Ted Obert from Channel 13 here. I, you were talking about these orbiters going to museums. If I can get one of you in trouble, did Houston deserve one of these? <laughs> You've lived. Oh, you're going to get us in trouble. I'd like to. <laughs> Uh, you know, speaking as a uh, taxpaying Houston citizen, I would have really liked to have seen a space shuttle come to Houston. Um, as to whether we deserve it, you know, I'll, I'll leave that to the, the folks who, who developed the criteria to pick where they really went. Uh, but I would have personally loved to see one come here. Okay, with that, that is all the time we have for. That will wrap up our briefing. Thank you very much.